again. Not all love stories are stories between couples. No, sometimes they're stories about people's love of place, love of purpose, um, and we just happen to have run across one of those in Ticonderoga, New York. This Jim Colley is one of the foremost Elvis impersonators in the United huh? States. And if you ask other Elvis impersonators who's the man, that's Jim Collins. That's Colley. who they talk about. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful fellow who mm -hmm. just happens to also be a maestro. A yeah. Maestro. Maestro. I like that. Yes. Because where most people might collect figurines and get a little, go to all the star cons and things like that. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> this man built two specs over a period of what he said, 10 years? The um, entire set for the original Star Trek because it was so overwhelming. I got to walk through the corridors In, with the lighting and everything just as though I was there. Jim's attention to detail in uh, his in both his act when you watch uh, his YouTube videos or his live performances of Elvis mm -hmm. are are masterful. Mm -hmm. His attention to detail with the Star Trek recreation we left there and said this is a labor of love. Absolutely. And Jim was gracious enough to grant us a few minutes uh, yes. uh, talking about his uh, Elvis career and where mm -hmm. that and what makes a bridge from being a professional Elvis to the maestro of Star Trek. Yes, yes. So, which, yep. love in America, enjoy James Colley. The Elvis Star Trek maestro. weird thing that happened. Um, you know, I worked on Star Trek The Next Generation for about two years doing costumes. Oh, I did. And then uh, the whole Elvis thing happened for me. Um, the, the guy that I worked with in four left the show, and I was kind of like a fish out of water, and it was very monotonous kind of stuff, and not too much fun. And I had the chance to do some Elvis stuff out of the blue, and then got an audition in Atlantic City, and never looked back. And then I ran into a buddy of mine who worked at the Six Flags Park about an hour from here. And mm -hmm. he said, yeah, would you be interested in coming to the park and doing that this summer? And I, I was very hesitant. And I came home and started talking to my family. And they were like, well, you'd be crazy not to. I mean, it's an hour from home. Mm -hmm. You get paid. You, you can be home at night. And I thought, yeah, really, that's not bad. I'll do it for a summer. Well, that ended up 15 years doing that, you know. <laughs> was there a point, because it sounds like as the Elvis, um, business kind of picked up, you were working more than you'd originally anticipated. Well, yeah, was, you know, was there a time when you wondered if it was the right thing to be doing? No, I, I always knew it's what I wanted to do. Uh -huh. uh, but when you when you experience life on the road, um, you get to a point when you're, especially if you love your home. So living out of a hotel, you know, is tough after a while. You just get to a point where I need to put my roots back down and, and regroup. Um, particularly when you are um, an actor, you're, you're, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a musician per se. I'm an actor. I'm being paid to be this other person. So every night you're putting on this other persona that isn't you. So after a while, you get to a point where, you know, I just want to be me for a while. I need me time for a while. The benefits of being Elvis are phenomenal. They really are. Um, if you're good at it and you can make a living at it, and you know, the fans are the re are the reward because they are very protective of Elvis and very demanding of, of what they see on stage. Um, there's this thing that everybody can be an Elvis impersonator, which drives me crazy. You, it gets to a point where it's parody. When you are on a certain level, you don't want people thinking, oh, I'm going to hire this guy and it's going to come in and it's going to be this or that. You don't, you don't want them to have any preconceived notions of, of that. You want them to judge you on what you do. Um, and that's the hard part of the Elvis thing. Uh, but the fans, you know, if you're good at it and you reach that that level, um, I don't. They don't believe that you're Elvis unless you're on stage entertaining them. And if you are good at it, during that one hour that you're on that stage, they see you as Elvis, and they treat you as, as if you're Elvis, and you make them feel like they're 16 years old again. And that's the beauty of the show. You know, if you can take a 70 year old person and make them feel like they're in high school again for that one hour, well, you know, you've done your job. You know, I still have this love of Star Trek. And so when you have free time, what do you do in your free time? Well, a lot of us pursue our hobbies. So Star Trek was a hobby for me. Well, we, you know, myself and two or three others, we grew up playing Star Trek in the backyard, you know, running around your toy guns and everything. And we always had this desire, what would it be like to, to be those guys, to be Captain Kirk, to, to, to be on that show? Well, you, you can't experience what it's like to be on the show. The show doesn't exist anymore, it's over. So we said, let's make our own movie. What do you intend to do, Captain? I don't know. 
don't know. So when you first moved into this space, yeah. this was just your yeah. movie set. Private this boys was club. not yeah. oh my God. <laughs> it was a private boy, like a big man cave. <laughs> That's a you big know, man cave. a big man cave, and and it was just a hobby, you know. And and these people would come from all over to share it with me, and we made our little movies that are online. You can go watch them. And so we started building little things to make our own movies. And uh, one of the friends ended up putting it online. Mm -hmm. The internet was brand new, and well, that just exploded. Hell is coming. Up. So before we knew it, you know, we had this merry band of people that were coming from all over the world. So each time we made a movie. We kept saying to ourselves, well, how do we make it better? How do we make it that much closer to the show? So we'd, we'd get another script and it would have a different set. Let's add that. Let's do this. So then you get to a point where you've outgrown the space you're in, you go to a bigger space and you keep adding. Well, then we finally got this building that was massive and thought, you know what, let's just build the whole thing. And so I called the people that I knew at CBS and said, hey, you know, I spent a lot of money. I built this incredible thing. Um, and, and the most joy that I get out of it is sharing it with everybody else. You know, I, I love to see the other Star Trek fans when they come in here and watch their face. And so I said, you know, would you guys be interested in perhaps opening it up to the public? Is there a way we can work together? And their response was, yeah, when they saw it. They were like, absolutely, let's, let's figure this out. So, and then this whole, like I said, this polar shift happened. And now we're open to the public and people have been coming. So. People, so what was what was the reaction? A lot of people thought it was kind of weird, you know. The people that weren't in the know thought it was kind of weird that we were making Star Trek films, you know, especially in a small town. They, you know, they don't really have any idea. But then, uh, as it grew, these people were coming from Australia, Germany, the UK, every state that you can think of, and they're staying in the hotels in Ticonderoga, and they're eating in the restaurants in Ticonderoga. So then you start to see the business community go, you know what? This is pretty cool. You know, and then when we announced that we had an actual license to, to open up, well then everybody was excited, you know, because they're seeing that this is an anchor to help, uh, you know, revitalize this little community. Um, you know, it, it's had its down times. You know, we used to have a mill here, the mill had moved, moved out of the village, now it's, it's further out of town. You know, Walmart came in and kind of hurt the small downtown life. Shut that damn thing off! And, and one of the things I want to do is see the Main Street come back. And little by little it's coming back, which is nice to see happening. So you've chased two dreams, yeah, different ones than and most people would even imagine. But there's, we all have people that tell us, oh, I have this novel I want to write. Here's a business that I want to do. Here's this yep. crazy idea, <laughs> you know, that I want to pursue, and yet they never do. Right. What would you tell those people? Because you put a lot on the line to make I both did. of these things happen. But you know, I, uh, my dad died when he was very young. And one of the things that my father said to me that made such an impression on me was, if you find something that you love as your job, you'll never work a day in your life. You know, it'll, you'll have moments where it's hard, but, but in the end, you're gonna have a great time and a good life. And that stuck with me. And because of that, I've never let anybody tell me no. No matter how crazy my ideas were, I, I'll chase them and, and, and if I can make it happen, I make it happen. You know, if it's something I love, I'm gonna go after it. And that's just the way I've always been. Cool. Well, I think if you truly love something, you know, something that, that drives your passion, if you don't chase it, I think you're asking for disaster in your life. You know what I mean? I think if you really care about something, you, you, you have to try to make it a reality. Um, if you let people tell you that your passion is foolish, you're ultimately going to destroy yourself. You're gonna go down a dark path. That's what I think. Um, and too many people don't follow their passion. They settle for mediocrity. They settle for that nine to five job that might pay them minimum wage and they struggle, perhaps oftentimes when they didn't need to. You know, um, Some people say you have to go to college, you have to have a degree. I, I don't believe any of that. I think you have to have a passion and you gotta have the drive to go after it and you can't let people tell you no. And I, and I think those that don't make that choice sometimes doom themselves. You know, Because if you don't feed your passion, your passion goes away and then what have you got? You, you've destroyed yourself. That's, that's what I feel. Thank you.